A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 8, Part 3, Slavery Still. Thirty years after the Missouri Compromise threatened to unravel the Union, the issue of slavery persevered as strongly as ever. Historians have remained puzzled by several anomalies regarding slavery. For example, even though by the 1850s there were higher profits in manufacturing in the South and in plantation farming, few planters gave up their gang-based labor systems to open factories. Several facts about slavery must thus be acknowledged at the outset. One, although slavery was profitable, profits and property rights alone do not explain its perpetuation. Two, the same free market that allowed Africans to be bought and sold at the same time exerted powerful pressures to liberate them. And three, Southerners needed the force of government to maintain and expand slavery, and without it, a combination of the market and slave revolts would have ultimately ended the institution. In sum, slavery embodied the worst aspects of unfettered capitalism wedded to uninhibited government power, all turning on the egregiously flawed definition of a human as property. Although the vast majority of Southern blacks were slaves prior to 1860, there were nonetheless a significant number of free African Americans living in what would become the Confederacy. As many as 262,000 free blacks lived in the South, with the ratio higher in the Upper South than in the Lower. In Virginia, for example, Census returns counted more than 58,000 free blacks out of a total black population of 548,000. And the number of free blacks had actually increased by about 3,700 in the decade prior to the Civil War. A large majority of those free African Americans lived in Alexandria, Fredericksburg, Norfolk, Lynchburg, and Petersburg. Virginia debated expelling all free blacks in 1832, but the measure, which was tied to a bill for gradual compensated emancipation, failed. Free blacks could stay, but for how long? It goes without saying that most blacks in the American South were slaves. Before the international slave trade was banned in 1808, approximately 661,000 slaves were brought into the United States or about 7% of all Africans transported across the Atlantic. America did not receive by any stretch of the imagination even a small portion of slaves shipped from Africa. Cuba topped the list with 787,000. By 1860, the South had a slave population of 3.84 million a figure that represented 60% of all the agricultural wealth in Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina. Other indicators reveal how critical a position slavery held in the overall wealth of the South. Wealth estimates by U.S. government based on the 1860 census showed that slaves accounted for $3 billion in mostly Southern wealth, an amount exceeding the investments in railroads and manufacturing combined. To an extent, but only to an extent, the approaching conflict was won over the definition of property rights. It might therefore be said that whenever the historical record says states' rights in the context of sectional debates, the phrase rights to own slaves should more correctly be inserted. When Alabama's Franklin W. Bowden wrote about the property rights in slaves, if any of these rights can be invaded, there is no security for the remainder. Northerners instinctively knew that the inverse was true. If one group of people could be condemned to slavery for their race, another could suffer the same fate for their religious convictions or their political affiliations. This aspect of slavery gnawed at the many non-slaveholders who composed the South's majority. 
Of all the Southerners who did own slaves, about 12% held most of the slaves. Whereas some 36% of Southern farms in the most fertile valley regions had no slave labor at all. Overall, nearly half the farms in the Cotton Belt were slaveless. Indeed, in some regions, free farmers dominated the politics, particularly Eastern Tennessee, Western Virginia, Northwestern Mississippi, and parts of Missouri. Even the small farmers who owned slaves steadily moved away from the large cash crop practice of growing cotton, entering small scale manufacturing by 1860. If one had little land, it made no sense economically to hold slaves. A field hand in the 1850s could cost $1,200, although prices fell with age and remaining productive years. The stability and performance of the system, however, arose from the large plantations, where a division of labor and assignment of slave gangs under the whip could overcome any inefficiencies associated with unfree labor. Robert Fogel and Stanley Ingerman, in their famous Time on the Cross, 1974, found that farms with slaves were 29% more productive than those without slaves, and more important, that the gains increased as farm size increased. What is surprising is that the profitability of slavery was doubted for as long as it was, but that was largely because of the biased comments of contemporaries like anti-slavery activist Frank Blair, who wrote that no man from a slave state could pass through the splendid farms of Sagamon and Morgan without permitting an envious sigh to escape him at the evident superiority of free labor. Nathaniel Banks argued in the 1850s before the audiences in Boston and New York that slavery was the foe of all industrial progress and the highest material prosperity. It was true that deep pockets of poverty existed in the South and that as a region, it lagged behind the United States per capita value added average in 1860 by a substantial $7, falling behind even the undeveloped Midwest. Adding to the unprofitability myth was a generation of Southern historians that included Ulrich Bonnell Phillips and Charles Sidnor, who could not reconcile the immorality of slavery with the obvious returns in the market system. They used flawed methodologies to conclude plantations had to be losing money. A final argument that slavery was unprofitable came from the backwardness of the South that is, its rural and non-industrial character. That seemed to confirm that slavery caused the relative lack of industry compared to that in the North. Conditions among slaves differed dramatically. Frederick Douglass pointed out that a city slave is almost a free citizen who enjoyed privileges altogether unknown to the whip-driven slave on the plantation. A slave undertaker in Savannah hired other slaves and made payments to his master of $250 a year. Artisans, mechanics, domestic servants, millers, ranchers, and other occupations were open to slaves. Simon Gray, a Mississippi slave, became a lumber raft captain whose crew included whites. Gray also invested in real estate, speculated in raw timber, and owned several houses. Half of the workforce at the Richmond Tredegar Iron Works was comprised of slaves. Even the most benign slavery, however, was always immoral and oppressive. Every female slave knew that ultimately, if her master chose to make sexual advances, she had no authority to refuse. The system legitimized rape, even though benign masters never touched their female slaves. Every field hand was subject to the lash. Some knew it more often than others. Much slavery in the South was cruel and violent, even by the standards of the defenders. Runaways, if caught, were mutilated or executed, sometimes tortured by being boiled in cauldrons, and slaves, for any reason, usually in subordination, were whipped. Free market advocates argued that it made no sense to destroy a $1,500 investment. 
but such contentions assume that the slave owners always acted as rational capitalists instead of occasionally racists involved in reinforcement of social power structures. Often the two intermingled, the capitalist mentality and the racial oppression, to the point that the system made no sense when viewed solely in the context of either the market or race relations. For example, Fogel and Ingerman's antiseptic economic conclusion that slaves were whipped on average of 0.7 times per year is put into perspective by pictures of slaves whose backs were scarred beyond recognition by the whip. Fogel and Ingerman's data were reconstructed from a single slave owner's diary and are very questionable. Other evidence is that beatings were so frequent that they occurred more than once a week and that fear of the lash permeated the plantations. Some states had laws against killing a slave though the punishments were relatively minor compared to the act. But such laws wilted in light of the slave's actual testimony. It's too bad to belong to folks that own your soul and body. That can tie you up to a tree with your face to the tree and your arms fastened tight around it, who take a long curling whip and cut the blood every lick. Folks a mile away could hear them awful whippings, Day was a terrible part of living. Plantation slave diets were rich in calories, but it is doubtful that provisions kept pace with the field labor, since data show that slaves born between 1790 and 1800 tended to be shorter than the free white population. In other respects, though, Fogel and Ingerman were right. While many historians have overemphasized the breakup of families under slavery, a point hammered home by Harriet Beecher Stowe's fictional Uncle Tom's Cabin. Fewer slaves were separated from their mates than is often portrayed in television or the movies. As the result of narratives from living former slaves collected during the New Deal by the Federal Writers Project, it has been determined that two-thirds had lived in nuclear families. If, however, one-third of all slave families were destroyed by force in the form of sales on the auction block, that statistic alone reiterates the oppressive and inhumane nature of the institution. Nevertheless, the old saw that crime does not pay does not always apply, as was the case with slavery. Several economic historians have placed the returns on slavery at about 8.5%, leaving no doubt that it was not only profitable in the short term, but viable in the long run because of the constantly increasing value of slaves as a scarce resource. It would be equally mistaken, however, to assume that slave-based plantation agriculture was so profitable as to funnel the South into slavery in an almost deterministic manner. Quite the contrary. Studies of Southern manufacturing have revealed that returns in fledgling Southern industries often exceeded 22%, and in some instances reached as high as 45%. Yet even those profits were not sufficient to pry the plantation owners' hands off their slaves. So what to make of a discrepancy of 45% returns in manufacturing compared with 8% in plantation agriculture? Why would Southerners pass up such gains in the industrial sector? Economic culture explains some of the reluctance. Few Southerners knew or understood the industrial system. More important, however, there were psychic gains associated with slave-based agriculture, dominance and control, that one could never find in industry. Gains on the plantations may have been lower, but they were undergirded by an entire way of life and the privileged position of the upper tiers of Southern society. The short answer to our question, then, is that it was about more than money. In the end, the persistence of slavery in the face of high non-agricultural returns testifies to the aspects of its non-economic character. Ultimately, slavery could exist only through the power of the state. It survived because political forces prevented the typical decay and destruction of slavery experienced elsewhere. Laws forcing free whites to join posses for runaway slaves, censoring males, and forbidding slaves to own property 
all emanated from government, not the market. Slaveholders passed statutes prohibiting the manumission of slaves throughout the South, banned the practice of slaves purchasing their own freedom, and used the criminal justice system to put teeth in the slave codes. States enforced laws against educating slaves and prohibiting slaves from testifying in court. Those laws existed atop still other statutes that restricted the movement of free blacks within the South or the disembarking of free black merchant sailors in southern ports. In total, slaveholders benefited from monumental reductions in the cost of slavery by, as economists would say, externalizing the costs to non-slave owners. Moreover, the system insulated itself from market pressures, for there was no true free market as long as slavery was permitted everywhere. Thus, there could be no market discipline. Capitalism's emancipating powers could work only where the government served as a neutral referee instead of a hired gun working for the slave owners. In contrast to Latin American countries and Mexico, which had instituted self-purchase, the American South moved in the opposite direction. It all made for a system in which, with each passing year, despite the advantages enjoyed by urban servant slaves and mechanics, slaves were increasingly less likely to win their freedom and be treated as people. Combined with the growing perversions of Christian doctrines in the South that maintained that blacks were permanent slaves, it was inevitable that the South would grow more repressive, both toward blacks and whites. Lincoln hoped that the natural limits of slavery would prove its undoing, that cotton production would peter out and slavery would become untenable. In this, Lincoln was in error. New uses for slave labor could always be found, and several studies have identified growing slave employment in cities and industry. Lincoln also failed to anticipate that slavery could easily be adapted to mining and other large-scale agriculture, and he did not appreciate the significance of the Southern Church's scriptural revisionism as it applies to blacks. In the long run, only the market or a war with the North could have saved the South from its trajectory. When slaveholders foisted the costs of the peculiar institution onto the Southern citizenry through government, no market correction was possible. Ultimately, Southern slave owners rejected both morality and the market, then went about trying to justify themselves. And we'll continue with this chapter in the next video. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for watching. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.